Thank you. And yeah, in fact, this is a follow-up talk to the talk given by Samuel Mimram yesterday morning. Um, Samuel is by education a computer scientist, at least first, uh, first of all. I'm by education rather a, a, a topologist. So the focus will shift a little bit. Samuel is much better by explaining the, uh, and what it's all about. Uh, I try to, to bring the topology a little bit further than he could in the introductory talk. But you will see, I mean, some of the slides in the beginning are very much, I mean, of the same flavor than, uh, as those you saw yesterday. So some of them I will go over quite quickly, but otherwise experience also tells me that it doesn't matter if you see things twice. So, oh, let's see. Let's hope it works. It is on. Mid, no, it shouldn't require. It did work first. I don't think. It shouldn't require. To shoot it. No, it's not that. Sorry about that. Here, here we go. So I'm very quickly go over the concurrency setting and then present you with three translations that somehow give you a possible way of modeling phenomena as they occur in, in a simple concurrency setting by means where algebraic topology together with some combinatorics show to be useful. So uh, f first of all, the first part is, uh, is, is part at least is, uh, I mean, looks li uh, very much like what Samuel presented in the beginning, but then I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit further and tell you how you can then recast these path spaces as some sort of simplicial spaces. In the second part, I w uh, they will get briefer and briefer, you'll see. The second part, the second translation uh, gives you a, a translation from these path spaces, these directed path spaces to certain configuration spaces. And then combinatorics comes in uh, even, even more dominantly. And the third one, which is in fact is due to Krzysztof Ziemanski, a colleague from Poland, gives a third translation which is more general, uh, which applies to a more general case, but then also gets more complicated and has to bring you into well, spaces that are built from permagehedra. And I'll try to explain what, what this is all about. And this is uh, the work of several people. My colleagues, Elisabeth Feistrup, uh, people at, uh, at Ecole Polytechnique, Samuel is one of them. Roma Schimulam, who's in the audience, Krzysztof Ziemanski from Poland, who will be there next week, but he was in there this week. So I think this is this I can go over quite quickly. Uh, it, it, it's meant just to explain what concurrency is all about. It's about the problems and also the uh, the challenges that occur when several threads or several computer programs uh, uh, work together in some way in in parallel. And uh, the main interest that already S uh, Samuel was uh, advocating is. Uh, specific applications tuned to static program analysis when it's really important that the programs that you run in c uh, uh, concurrently, they are in the end correct. And you don't end up in a state where, I mean, where a catastrophe uh, happens. And uh, maybe I, I just tell you that Samuel and colleagues, they bef before they went to Ecole Polytechnique, they, wor they worked for the, the Atomic Energy Center, and there it's clear that uh, you have to avoid catastrophes. <coughs> So uh, let's get back to the model a, a, a little bit in other words than the ones uh, uh, Samuel presented them. You think you have a number of processes competing for a number of resources, and these resources can only be served at a given time by a num for a number of processes. In, in the case of mutexes that Samuel presented for you yesterday, it's only one that can be served at a given time, a printer, for example. Uh, and there are others when the number is somehow restricted. And the uh, semantics that is used for that is that you put a, a lock on such a, uh, on, on such a common resource. The, uh, the names for these come from Dutch, in fact, because Dijkstra, who invented this technology, is, uh, was Dutch. So P means you put a lock on it, V means you relinquish it again. <coughs> And the thing become interesting when it's not only one processor who's do doing this, uh, who runs through such a protocol. And remind you, from, new, from now on, I'm focused only on these locks, and I'll forget anything about all the calculations and all the uh, actions that uh, happen in between, because that's not important for 
<coughs> for this purpose here. So you saw already this diagram that occurs when you have two processes in parallel that run with this, this series of locks and relinquishings. And you can see, I mean, you have a certain part of forbidden area. You have something, uh, uh, some call it doomed, a doomed area where you, where you can't, when you enter it, you can no longer uh, uh, reach the, the final state. And the most important things is that, well, the ex executions that you are looking at are directed paths in the sense that when you project them down to any of the axes, you will always get a, an increasing path, and that makes things, I mean, I in a sense, more difficult and also more interesting because that provides some new topological challenges for you. And the second thing that I want to mention is that, well, it's not the individual paths that are the most uh, interesting, but it's the homotopy classes and the specific version of homotopy that you have to look at in the two-dimensional case that doesn't play a big role but as soon as you get into a higher dimension it plays a big role homotopy means uh, in this sense this directed hom version of homotopy means that not only are the paths that you're looking at are homotopic as such but the one parameter deformation that you uh, that you invoke is through directed paths all the way through and we, we have already seen deadlocks and uh, doomed regions and so on. So the state space that we are looking at in the more general case is you take some cube and in this cube you dig holes and all these holes are also of the form of cubes or you could say of hyper-rectangles and isostatic means just that they are parallel to the axis. So you have holes of this form, they are also of the form of cubes and the space, state space that we are looking at is you take a cube and I put an arrow on it already to symbolize that, uh, that we also are looking at directed paths in those. But uh, as, a, as a space, as a topological space, it's just a cube from which a number of these hyper rectangles has been dug out, digged out. And of course, you have the same order inherited. You look at order preserving paths and instead of this simple case that we are mainly concentrating upon during this talk, there are more general ones where you look at cubical complexes. Uh, they were already explained to you. I have a, a later sl a slide later explaining them, and them again to you. I mean, for topologists, one would say they are a little bit like simplicial complexes, but everything is built out of, out of, hyper of cubes instead of out of simplices and gluing together. And of course, the these paths are order preserving. Someone had a much more, uh, um, uh, um, say, categorical way of presenting it as a, as a, as a, as a pre, uh, via, via a pre sheaf. But I essentially, this is the same for what comes out of it. So, what we are looking at is a state space with holes. We look at paths from some uh, start point to some end point. You can vary them in the end. You have preferred direction, you have dihomotopies. And then you can already see that this really matters. I can quickly go over that. Uh, uh, Samuel had it already, already in the two-dimensional case where everything can be drawn, and this is one of the big advantages here. Well, uh, the, homot uh, the uh, homotopy um, type of the state space doesn't tell you uh, enough in order to be saying something, uh, something versatile, uh, something important about the space of directed paths. Here you have four classes up to dihomotopy. Here you have three classes. There is a class, in fact, that is allowed in the, in the, uh, the non-directed case, but this is forbidden in, in this case. <coughs> so the question is, uh, well, how can one still use algebraic topology? How can one use algebraic topology to somehow come from the state space to the space of executions? C is there a way of modeling this space by something that allows you to make calculations in the very end. And the situation becomes, in a way, more complicated than in ordinary topology because, first of all, the main <laughs> point is that, well, the reverse of a die path in general will not be a die path again. And that, right away, gives you less structure on algebraic invariant. So there is no way to, uh, well, uh, let's say, the fundamental group as such is not very interesting. So loops, in general, in, in many cases, do not tell you much. You still have concatenation, but you don't have cancellation. Uh, Samuel already showed you something like, uh, like this. I, I'll have a little bit different uh, thing to say about it. So suppose you uh, want to classify directed paths 
in a big cube from which the minor cube has been taken out, the floating cube, so, uh, as we say sometimes for fun. So if you, if you try to classify a directed path from this point to that point, you, s you have, of course, you have two homotopy classes, but you have only two directed ones, because if you want to deform this one, I mean, if, if you insist on the endpoints, there is no way of coming from the one in the front to the one on the back by, di by directed paths. Whereas when you concatenate both with this stifled path here, so now you are looking at paths starting here and ending here, it's not very difficult to see that, uh, well, you get paths that are Directly homotopy, uh, directly homotopy to each other, and it means that cancellation doesn't work. So you can't hope for any group structures. You can still have a category structures, and as Samuel already mentioned, you have still a van Kampen theorem. But when you try to find out what does this van Kampen theorem actually mean and make it useful for calculation, it's not so easy. I can assure you. Let me show one other example that, that uh, at least when we saw it for the first time, it was, uh, it was a bit mind-boggling. So here, what I, uh, I want f uh, there are several things that I want to show with the ex example. The first of them is that directed homotopy is not the same as usual homotopy of dipath, even if you insist on, on the same endpoints. So here I have a, a, an obstruction that can arise by these PV programs. So you have two wedges. Here is a wedge in front, and here is a wedge in the end. Uh, and I have a a, a draw for you a path going through this hole. So I'm not assuming that these two wedges that they touch each other. So it's clear that uh, while you can manipulate this thread by drawing, tr by taking it around this obstruction so that you in the end get a thread that is lying on the one skeleton of, of, the, of the bigger cube. But it's also quite um, believable, I think, at least in the first thing, that, that place that you cannot do that without violating directedness somewhere on the way. And, uh, well, if this is, uh, it, looks, it looks very plausible, but the question is how, how can you actually prove that? Another remark that I want to make is that, well, in two-dimensional cases, or when you only use the mutexes that Samuel uh, 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 talked about yesterday, such a case cannot occur. In these cases, uh, directed homotopy is, in fact, the same as homotopy of dipaths. In fact, when you do the calculations in this case, you can show that the space of paths, so now I'm, we are no, no longer looking at the, at, at this, at the, at the at the state space, but the sp space of paths, so that's what I'm mainly be concerned with in the rest of the talk in this case, well, it has the form of the wedge of two as ones, two circles, and one particular point uh, disconnected from the other ones. This particular point is represented by all paths that are directly homotopy to the one I've seen here. The two other ones somehow tell you in which ways you go around the first obstruction or the second obstruction, and I mean, there is, there's a way how, it, how they are combined to each other. But I mean, explaining this uh, very geometrically is intricate and would, would take too long time. So what is, what is uh, the goal of the whole thing? Well, first of all, we, we, we start with a Euclidean cubical complex, so uh, this is just Rn from which uh, uh, some holes are dug, uh, dig, uh, have been taken out. You can generalize that to what is more uh, important or more usual in, in, in for programs. Well, it's not just a line for each processor, but you have a product of directed graphs. It's not very difficult. This generalization is not very difficult, but uh, just to make it accessible here, I'm not going to talking a lot about that. And finally, the higher dimensional automata that really uh, uh, allow you to, to express concurrent programs in much more generality, well, that, that's a bigger step, and I'll come back to that in the end. So what we want is, the challenge is that from such a, space, a state space, and I'll concentrate for this talk on this simple case here, we want to infor, infer information about the space of all paths in the space, the directed paths, from a given start point to a given end point. 
and those can, in principle, vary. So, <coughs> quite quickly again, because we have heard about that, we have heard about directed spaces, these spaces uh, which, which are axiomatized in the work of Marco Grandes. So for us, it's just this case where we look at paths where the directed structure comes from directed structure in Rn. But you can generalize that very much. And we are looking at paths from a start point to an end point and want somehow to say something about what is the, ho sorry, what is the homotopy uh, type of the space what information can we get out of it? And in fact, the, the first information about it is th the number of classes or the classes that you have in this space. So these are just the connected components in the space of paths. So that's the aim, a description of the homotopy type of this path space. And let me, uh, let me stress that uh, the, the, the state space, for the state space, of course, it's important that it has a direction, but the path space as such doesn't have a direction any longer. So what for applications already is, uh, is uh, maybe the most important thing is just, I mean, how many path components are there? How can you access them? Because if you know this number of path com components is restricted, for verification of computer uh, co concurrent programs, you can just run one as uh, one representative, and this one representative will, will will have the same results for every other path in the same directed homotopy class. So as soon as you have as achieved some uh, reduction in this case, I mean you you have achieved something for for verification purposes. Okay. So now I'll try to present a first way of how one can get hold on the space of execution, the space of directed paths, by some combinatorial or topological way of, uh, of, of, of representing it, in particular something that in the end is finite dimensional, so that at least in principle it is amenable to calculations. So let's, let's get started here. So I present for you here a state space. It's the same state space in the first uh, in the first place, consisting of a, a, a rectangle or a cube from which two holes are punched out. Is the first situation and the second situation that is a bit differ different. You can see that. And now I describe certain subspaces of the space of executions, and the subspaces are. Uh, are such that you can say, okay, these are subspaces in which you are not allowed to enter these white parts as well. So the white parts uh, somehow are extended obstruction. You extend the obstructions, in this case, in both cases below. In this case, is in one of them below and the other one to the left. And you can see all other combinations. So it's it's more or less clear uh, when you look at it that I um, mean every di directed path will lie in at least one of these four possible subspaces, <coughs> and uh, in the second case you can see that the two situations I mean they are constructed in exactly the same way they differ because in the second case where when I do these extended obstructions somehow you get a case where well, there is no way to start here and to end here by a directed path. You run in a deadlock situation, and therefore, the, I mean, this case doesn't give you, uh, give you give rise to uh, an allowed directed path. Second observation is that, well, if you look at all possible directed paths in any of these situations, you get a contractible space. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how you prove that. It's, it's not very difficult. But uh, so, so we are in a situation, in, at least in this particular simple case, where you can say, okay, you, you have decomposed the whole space of a, a directed path into chunks that are well understood. And now the only question is, how can you combine them? And uh, in order to make it clear uh, about this question, how can you combine them, let's focus on the simpler situation in 3D. So here's the 3D situation where what you should think about is, is you have a big three-dimensional cube and in it is a floating cube that is forbidden. And now again I look at subspaces of the space of all executions. 
in the first case, I look at all of those that go through this shaded left area, which means that the directed path has to stay somewhere. It has to pass, so to speak, to the left of this obstruction. Second case, you stay until you reach the top end of the obstruction. You stay in front of it, and here you stay below. It's also in these cases not s difficult to see that well every directed path has to be either of that kind or of that kind or of that kind. Well, either I shouldn't say I shouldn't say either. It's of one of these three kinds, but there are also intersections. In this case, you can see well. Uh, I mean, in this case, you can stay both in front and uh, and to the left of of the obstruction, and so on. So in general, two restrictions can be combined, but not three of them. So in this case, I mean, you already have some, so somehow the idea, so what you, what, you, what you see here is, um, well, you have these three cases, and two by two they can be combined. So what you get out of it is a hollow two simplex, so it looks like a, a one-dimensional sphere. <coughs> And this is true much more generally. You have combinations of such things, and you have to understand those, and this helps you to understand the state space in general. So let me now briefly explain how you can ex extend this very first idea more generally. So I've already written down some matrices, some binary matrices up here. And this is a way how you can somehow book, uh, uh, organize the bookkeeping of such situations. So, for example, this one zero and this one zero means that you stay, you restrict yourself to stay on the left of both of, sorry, left of the first and the second obstruction. In this case, well, it means you restrict this one to the left one, the other one below, and so on. So, all these spaces somehow, all these uh, the restricted path spaces can be described as some set of binary, binary matrices, the number of rows tells you uh, how many obstructions you have, the, uh, the number of columns, in this case two, in this case just one, the number of uh, columns tells you in how many directions you can obstruct. So uh, another way to say that uh, you have to stay on the left is you forbid, you extend this, uh, this path to the left and by this way forbidding it to, to, to go to, uh, to, to to go further to the right. So <coughs> the bookkeeping now is the following. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you don't understand it right away, but it, 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 this is just a way of expressing by inequalities that, I mean, before you reach, reach an, upper, uh, an upper end, so these, these fat ones are always the upper corners, uh, before, before you reach some, some upper corner, you have to stay below or in front or whatever it is. So you restrict direction J at whole I. So this is what XIJ means. And the matrices that we are looking at describe you a pattern of such restrictions. And now, well, if you have these binary matrices, you have a poset of them. So one matrix is uh, bigger than another one if it contains uh, ones at the same places where, where the smaller one has a one, the bigger one has to have a one as well. So that's the poset order. I mean, just that's just. I mean, you f you can forget about it. That it's a matrix. It's just the poset in the I within the binary strings that you're con considering. Okay, and now what what I more or less already told you is uh, well, first of all, the set of all paths from a given star point to a given endpoint. It contains subspaces described by all sorts of these restrictions. And now you run over all matrices where this makes sense, and the star means at least one direction has to be uh, has to be restricted, because when you don't make any restrictions, I mean you wouldn't get anything contractible out of it. So as soon as you restrict, you get something contractible out of it, and so the f the point is that the question is now. When you look at the individual chunks that you get described here, in the end, there are two possibilities. Either 
this restricted state space is empty or it's contractible. So it's the simplest situation that you can possibly look at. And why is that the case? Well, when you look at the geometric situation and, and write, it, write it down, I'm not going to do it here, but um, may, maybe just, just in the simplest case, I can make you a small drawing. So, so if this is the one, uh, one uh, forbidden rectangle here, and what you what you allow in in the case that you stay under it is to take this this subspace that looks like this shaded area, and then when you look at it is well when you take two points in it, two points in this case. Let's see how sh how, wha how should I choose them? For example, here and and there and then you look at the least upper bound of the two, in any case, wherever you place them, it will always be contained in, in this part of it. And this is a way how you can construct also a way of getting from one point via the least upper bound to the other one, and you can extend the two paths. That's the, the general idea. So, I mean, the, the take-home message is you have this path space, and the path space consists of sub chunks and o each of these sub chunks is either empty or contractible and of course it's important to find out which of them is which but when you've done that let's assume that well you can describe everything completely combinatorially so uh, depending on whether such a, a state space a restricted state space is empty or not so let's say it's uh, not empty you, you can talk about matrices that are alive or not. So if you go up in the direction of uh, this poset, where you impose more and more restrictions, so you start with something that alive, uh, that's alive, uh, if at a certain point, well, you, you, you might get something that is no longer alive. I'll, I'll show you examples in, in a moment. And in, instead of doing that in, in a combinatorial way, you can also do it in a, in a topological way, I already described you such a situation here. You, you, you build up, for every of this, uh, these matrices, you build up a product of simplices, one simplex for every, one simplex for every of these holes, and uh, I mean, which part of it you in fact infer, in which uh, you include depends on the situation. So here you have the situation where two restrictions are allowed, so uh, you plug in this simplex and that simplex and that simplex, but you don't plug in the interior because that gives rise to restrictions that are no longer allowable. So there is a way of describing both uh, just a combinatorial poset category and to model it by products of simplices that are suitably glued together. So let's look at the examples we had before. I mean, this is very trivial because in this case, there, are n there is no way to combine uh, at any of these obstructions two uh, restrictions. For example, you cannot say at this obstruction you stay both below it and to the left of it. So in this case, you get four uh, zero simplices, four points. In the other case, that without a restriction of directedness looks completely the same. Well, this is, this is a, an, a matrix that is alive, this one is alive, this one is alive, but this one is dead because there is no directed path from here to there, so there are just three possible combinations. This is a bit more interesting. This is the case with a floating cube. Well, the general situation and the generalization from that one is that instead of looking just of a uh, uh, two simplex without the interior, you will have to look at the boundary of an n minus one dimensional simplex. So the poset that you look at, in it, you look at all rows consisting of zeros and ones, and you discard the one that only consists of ones. And this is the same as in, in such a situation, I mean, you discard the interior, so what you get out of it in this situation is a combinatorial proof that the space of all paths from start to the end in this situation is the same as the boundary of an n minus one simplex, and that's of course the same as a, an n minus two simplex. Here's a second case where you have two of those. So now you have two matrices, 
But again, what you would disallow is that you have a matrix with two one one one, uh, with one of them being a one 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 rows. So in this case, the state of uh, the space of all paths starting here and ending here is the product of two spheres. Uh, this is already a, a slide uh, for for the next purpose, showing you some situation with alive and 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 dead matrices. So in this case, you have a restriction. You have put a restriction on the first. Uh, obstruction saying that you will stay in this case on the left of uh, of it in in the other case you will stay i think it's below it so you have th these uh, paths and here's a case where in fact you will run into a deadlock you have uh, obstructed both b above and below uh, and to the right and 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 uh, on the other side of it and this gives you it gives rise to a dead situation and this is in fact uh, now one can prove quite easily when when you have the the right decomposition that the space of all paths at the first place is the same as this prod simplicial complex that I at least sketch or the nerve of this category uh, the and the category that you get out of the process of zero one matrices and here is, is a it's 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 easy as soon as uh, as you know what you, what you do well, you take a, a number of functors from this category of, of matrices into a topological spaces. One of them says, okay, you, you, to such a matrix, you, uh, you associate the space of all paths with the restrictions that are given by the matrix. The second uh, possibility says, okay, you build this topological space that is built out of products of simplices for to every such matrix corresponds a product of simplices and this, the third one which is the easiest one is you plug in a, a point at every place so from the construction it's more or less clear that when you take the co-limit of this first functor what you get is the space of all paths this is nothing than saying that the space of all paths decomposes as the space of all such restricted paths and and, and, and the functor as such more or less captures the intersections between the non-trivial spaces of the non-empty spaces of that. And the same holds for the second one. Whereas when you take the homotopy co-limit of the second one, of, this, of the last one, that's exactly what gives you the nerve of the category. And now we are in a good situation. I mean, first of all, uh, because this, these spaces are all contractible, these spaces are all contractible, and of course, these ones are also. So the homotopic limits, they coincide. You just take the spaces from this contractual space to the point and from this contractual space to that point. So that shows you that the homotopic limits that you get out of those are the same. And if you know the projection lemma about comparing homotopic limits and colimits, we are in a good situation. Everything has the homotopy type of a, of a CW complex, so there is no no uh, reason to make a difference between homotopy limits and limits. And now we are through. Uh, now we are through. Sorry, because uh, well, this this space and this space and these states they have the same homotopy limits, and since homotopy limits coincide with limits in the first two cases. Uh, we, we also get the same s the same sort of spaces. So this one is homotopy equivalent to that one via the nerve of that category. So that's, if you know the nerve lemma, not very surprising. As soon as you est have established the way of cutting off up your state space or your uh, space of of paths. So let me uh, say a little bit how you can do that uh, a little bit more algorithmically. So I already explained that, well, a way of getting these restricted path spaces is that, well, you associate to the obstructions. In, or in order to say that you stay below these obstructions, you can also say, okay, yeah, I, I remove more. And what the, uh, the thing that you remove more is a, a hyper-rectangle where you start in all, sorry, where you start at zero in all cases apart from where you where where you uh, the two dimension the two uh, pl uh, sorry this place where where you have the restriction so here you, here you extend to the left and here you extend below 
So instead of saying um, you stay in this, in this part, you can also say, well, this is a new stage space. And then you can use the technology with uh, 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 trying to find out whether the state, is, uh, the state space is empty or not. Well, the question is more or less, is there a deadlock occurring or not? So this is also why we call these matrices deadlocks. Uh, dead matrices, they arise when, when a deadlock is achieved on the way. So I think they don't think I want to go into the details, but, but just, just showing you one of these cases here, a dead matrix can arise in this case if you restrict both to the left and to the to on top and, and, and to the right. Well, then there is no way to pass this obstruction, and this means you, ha you get a matrix, a situation that, uh, that, uh, that provides you with a, a, dead, uh, a dead end in the sense that there is no way to passing from the start to the end with this extra obstruction. So this to say that in the end what you check is a bunch of inequalities and if these inequalities are satisfied together that comes from the deadlock algorithm that Samuel expla explained to you later uh, 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 yesterday, then you can detect uh, matrices that are either dead or or uh, so, so the way how you do it is you detect these dead matrices and then you know that everything that you get on top of it, if you impose more restrictions than what you get by the dead matrix, that will be even more dead <laughs> than dead. And only what's below the dead matrix is what survives. And these are then the biggest products of simplices that you have to glue together in the end. So one ends up by looking at maximal alive matrices and uh, these correspond to maximal simplex product in this plot simplicial complexes. And this can be as characterized in the way as soon as you go one step off at, at, at one particular place, you exchange a zero by a one, you will end up by a matrix that is dead. So again, a, a very simple-minded example here, uh, you have uh, what you forbid, what you, what you allow is a vector the, the maximal ones are the vectors with the single zero because you have to throw out the, this row consisting only of ones. And what you get out in the end then is, a, the, is just, I mean, now we have only one obstruction, is the boundary of an n minus one simplex. Everything else apart from this one is allowed. The maximal simplices correspond to faces where one of the ones is, is uh, exchanged to a zero. So uh, what is it good for? What can, be, what can be used in it? Well, we can, in fact, and now we have a model that is maybe large, but it has a structure of a simplicial complex. The product of simplicial complexes is still a simplicial complex. One can use the product structure to make it a little bit easier. So we can find out by brute force what the number of uh, path components is, wh we can try to find out what is, uh, wh whether the spaces are simply connected and so on. And this has Im been implemented by the group at the Ecole Polytechnique, Samuel is one of, one of them, and in particular the rank of H0, you can say something relatively fast about that, whereas more uh, uh, general computations, well, uh, this is not I think it is not far enough to, to, to go to something uh, decisive. First of all, this uh, I'll come back to that. This model is a bit too large still. It's easier to uh, comprehend, but it's too large. Uh, so the dimensions that you get are too large, but there is homology software that has been adapted to the case that for simple cases works quite well. But as I said, I mean, the drawback is that you have still an exponential growth. You have an exponential growth in the number of obstructions and the number of processes. So what you get is a subcomplex of, well, something that is really, really large. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an n minus 2 sphere to the L. And if L is big, I mean, that's a very big complex and, and, and some very bad things come out of it. So uh, we are working on, 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 on alternatives, but this is not mature, at least not mature enough for uh, such a talk. So what we have so far is um <coughs> something about this state space with fixed endpoints, 
what I wanted at least to, 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 to relate a little bit to the topological data uh, analysis community is, well, there is, a, there is some, I mean, some weak uh, connection. If you, instead of taking a specific start point and a specific end point, you want to see what happens in between somehow. So you fix another start point, you fix another, maybe an in-between start point and an in-between end point. Well, then you have spaces um, via, via inclusion maps, uh, you get filtrations again. You fix, let's say you fix a specific path from A prime to A and a specific path from B to B prime. Then you get inclusion maps from the paths starting at intermediate points to points that are, uh, that are further away from each other. And here one can also ask, you, you can ask yourself at which thresholds do the homotopy types change? Just as one asks uh, the same question in, in topological data analysis. And how can one somehow cut up x cross x, this means start point here, end point here, into components, sorry, into components, into components so that the homotopy types are don't vary. So, so what the dream is somehow to say, okay, just as the barcodes, you have start points and end points, and um, well, somehow you can characterize the homotopy type of what, what uh, is in between, and you can also find out how much of it survives to the next step and comes from the, f from the step before. So one can also here speak uh, about birth and death of homology classes. But the situation is clearly more complicated because from the start on, everything is multidimensional. So it's clearly something, if there is a parallel, there's a parallel to multidimensional persistence. And also, <coughs> it's, it's the state space that you're looking at is not even a complete uh, Rn or Z to the N or something, but there's something that where, where ducks at, where holes are ducking. So the situation is more complicated from uh, the start uh, right away. So the last remark is that uh, another thing, another thing that I would uh, try to understand better. I hope to learn a little bit about it uh, next week. Is uh, to find a satisfactory notion of directed homotopy. And so this that can also be a challenge for you. I mean the uh, the uh, the, uh, the idea that pops up right away is you have two state spaces and you compare them with each other and say okay you need a a map in one direction, the map in the other direction, and they compose as directed maps in a way so that, uh, well, the composition of two maps in one direction and the composition in the other direction is directly homotopic to the identity. But that's clearly not good enough because it doesn't say you enough about the state space, the, the spaces of execution, the spaces of paths in between. So a good notion of directed homotopy equivalence needs to infer that also the spaces of, homo of, of paths between the two space state spaces somehow gives you a homotopy equivalence. And everything that goes closer into that direction is welcome. So there are some ideas into that direction, but th we are sti still clearly searching for, for good ideas in that direction. And with that, I think it's a good point to break. <laughs> okay. Uh, before, I uh, before I continue with other ways of, of, of formulating these directed path spaces, let me give you one result that at least when I saw it for the first time was quite surprising. So maybe you, from the simple examples that I gave you so far, you have the impressions, okay, you can get uh, spaces like product of spheres and so on, but um, I mean not, not too complicated spaces, as spaces of directed paths in this simple situation where you dug in, dig in holes into Euclidean spaces. But it turns out the opposite is true. Everything that you can think of, you can somehow realize. And this is a result by Krzysztof Ziemanski that he first presented in 2013. I think it was published in 2015. So whatever finite simplicial complex you can up with, there is a way of finding a Euclidean cubical complex. So in the sense you have Rn and you dig in such hyperrectangular holes, such that the space of path from the start to the end is homotopy equivalent to the finest simplicial complex that you start with. And moreover, 
Well, this is just a Euclidean complex, but the question is, can you do it by such a PV program? Well, it's almost true. The only thing is that maybe you have to pay with by adding an extra sphere. We are not sure whether we can get rid of it. But of course, I mean, this is just this is just a small thing. So in fact, I mean, these, comp these spaces that you get out of it can get as, com as complicated as, as long as they are finite as you can imagine. I mean, one of the nice things is that uh, in, in, in to start with, of course, when you take spaces of paths, you don't know whether we get a final model out of it right away. But this, this is what the construction tells you. You get always something finite of it, and directedness uh, implies somehow finiteness. You don't have uh, infinite loops that can get something infinite dimensional out of it, but it can get as complicated as you want. And the proof is, when you know uh, work uh, about s subspace arrangement, it's not that difficult even, but, but I have no time to go through it. So just to give a simple example of how, how you do it, in fact, when you want to have a projective plane as execution space, you start by representing the, pr uh, the projective plane and you triangulate it. Uh, the uh, most efficient way to do it is you build it by 10 rectangles on six vertices. And the way how you construct such a cubic uh, complex or PV program is, well, you need six pros processes and you need, in fact, 10 plus 30. It turns out the 10 is these, these 10 rectangles here. And 30 is, uh, well, I, I don't think I will tell you about that. that that's some, some artificial junk, junk to, to that. Resources of capacity five, each of them, and then you get a space that is homotopy equivalent to RP2. Okay, but now I want to present you with another idea that uh, gives, uh, gives another way of modeling the same object, namely the, the, the space of directed paths. So now we have to think about a different representation. And I know of my own experience, it's always difficult to uh, change representations of what you have in mind. <coughs> so now the, uh, the principal situation is the same as before. You have one process model by, OK, you have a number of P's and B's and B's and, and B's. But if you think about it, in the first place, where I put these P's and B's, uh, P's and B's on the timeline, that was somehow artificial. Um, it's only the order that, that is important. And now instead of measuring where these P's and B's are on, on a line, I think of a, pa of, of, a, of, a s of a path by going through this interval, and the only thing I note is at what time I capture a lock, I capture another lock, at what time I relinquish a lock, at what time I relinquish another lock. So what would you get for one semaphore, for one of these, uh, 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 it's, not, it's not, not true, it's not one semaphore, but one processor, I should have said, the path space is captured by times, and the number of times comes with an order. And if you have a number of ordered inter a number of ordered reals between zero and one, well, you can see that as an element of the open simplex of the, the appropriate dimensions. Oh, so open, first of all, because zero is not allowed and one is not allowed, but it's also not allowed that T1 is equal to T2. It's not, equal, not allowed that T2 is equal to T3. So this eliminishes, eliminishes the faces of the, of the four-dimensional simplex. But what you can do for one process, I should have said instead of semaphore, I'm, I apologize. So what you can do for one of them, you can do for a number of them, so now you, for each of them, you note the time of excess of various logs and the time of relinquishing these. So this gives you an, for each of them, gives you an element of a, an, a simplex of an appropriate dimension. And the whole p directed path, you can at least get some idea of, uh, of it by noting all these things. And this gives you an element in a product of open simplices. And now when you think about which of these points that you get in the open, which of these times, and all of these, do you think of it of times, which of these tuples of times are forbidden? Well, when you have a, such a, <coughs> a semaphore of a given capacity, if it's capacity n minus 1, it says, well, it's not allowed that all of them uh, coming, uh, having to do with the same semaphore, so I, I call it I here, 
are acquired before one of the, them is released. So it gives rise to a number of uh, to uh, to an to a number of inequalities of these, uh, these types. And if you have a smaller capacity, well, there are more of those that you have to consider. Don't, let's not go into, into detail. Anyway, in order to describe what is forbidden in such a space, you look at a set of inequalities of the type that certain maximums of certain coordinates have to be. It's forbidden that maximum of certain coordinates, a certain number of coordinates is less than the minima of certain coordinates within this space. And the path space, we try to find out that it is the same as a configuration space of the type where you have a product of such simplices arising of that, and from that be cut out a forbidden region, and now the forbidden region is given by a bunch of these inequalities, the maximum of certain, uh, certain uh, uh, times is less than the minimum of certain other times. So it's just coordinates where you compare um, coordinates from one of the simplexes with other coordinates of another simplex. Uh, so this brings us closer to uh, uh, another area where combinatorics and topology somehow are can be linked fruitfully to each other. So uh, let me talk briefly about where something similar occurs in another situation. So these are the so-called arrangement and in particular subspace arrangements. So what you, what people have done there is you look at um, you look at a Euclidean space or a projective space could also be an affine space, and in this you have a number of subspaces. So these subspaces, in in many cases, they are hyperplanes. They sometimes uh, they are vector vector subspaces. Sometimes they are just hyperplanes. Uh, hyper uh, spaces of appropriate different dimensions, and what and these dimen these spaces are then also forbidden, but now in in ordinary n-dimensional space, Rn or Cn or projective space or whatever you consider, and the idea is we want to know something about the complement, and we want to uh, determine topological properties of the pro of the complement by just looking at or by, by, by using no knowledge about the lattice of the intersections of all these hyperplanes or whatever the, they are. And again here, the important thing is, do these hyperplanes, do they intersect a certain number of them uh, trivially? Uh, do they intersect by another s as, a, as another s uh, hyperplane? Or do they intersect tri trivially, I mean, as, a, as an empty set? And I mean, there are configuration uh, spaces have been studied for many reasons. For example, just in physics, you can think about you have n particles that live in some f uh, state space, and then you want uh, to look at non colliding, uh, uh, non -colliding n tuples of particles. So, this is what you can see here. If you take different particles, they sh should be in different positions. And you want to know something about the complement of this space namely where you allow two of them, th these are generalized diagonals in x to the n. Or, more generally, maybe it's possible that two of them collide, but not three of them. This has also been studied by people. And in, in the case where x is simple, quite a lot is known. For example, if uh, n is just the reals, and you, allow, you disallow that n of them collide, well, what you, t what, what, you, what you take out is the diagonal in an Rn, taking out the diagonal, well, this is just homotopy equivalent to, a, to an n minus two dimensional sphere. And this has been generalized by people. So this is the diagonal where all of them are equal. But you can also ask about what, what happens when k of them are not allowed to be equal. These spaces have been considered by this technology where you analyze the lattice of, intersec of possible intersection. In this case, the homology is has been determined, and it turns out it's concentrated in certain dimensions. And more recently, people have been uh, able to understand also the cohomology ring. Though the space itself, I mean, how does it look like? Can you compare it to some other space that we know more about? Uh, I don't think there is. there are uh, clear results about that. So we know something about the topological invariance, but not, about this, not so much about the spaces themselves. So now we have a, in some sense, a similar situation. We want also uh, make use of a 
semi-lattice zones or intersections of disallowed situation. But let me point out that the situation is similar in certain cases because the semi-lattice is, is, is what is important, but it is also dif different from what we have been looking at uh, in, in the previous slide. So one difference is that the ambient space that we are looking about is no longer an Euclidean space. It is now it's a product of this simplicis. And this is just a way of saying order now matters. I mean, simplicis are just spaces in which order matters, whereas in Iran, order doesn't matter. And the other difference is that, and that makes uh, the situation really more, in, uh, more complicated and uh, to tell you the truth, only in very uh, restricted cases we have a solution to that, is that we look to complements of solutions of inequalities and not of equations. So two things that, uh, that, that make life more interesting, more difficult than compared to the case where quite a lot is known. So because it's difficult with inequalities, let me present you a case where we have a solution. That's the case where we make just instantaneous use, if, if, I, comp if I compare to the computer si situation, the concurrency situation, it's the situation where you take a log and relinquish it right after that. So this means in this case is the times of excess, you ha don't have to bother about uh, inequalities, but you just have to disallow certain equalities. So let make, let's take a very simple-minded example here. So here, I've, uh, this is the still the situation with P's and V's occurring at the same time. And now if you have several of these uh, situations, the state space from the previous representation that you would look at is the state of all is th this uh, rectangle from which you have taken out these ni nine points in, in this particular example. When we make the translation of looking at, instead of you look at time vectors, so this is excesses to the first three the, to the points at the first axis and accesses to the point on the third axis. But what you, what you have to disallow is that you access, say, point number two here at the same time as you uh, access point number one at the first row. So you, you disallow you to enter this point. So when you look at it, what, what is I exactly disallowed? It's the, the vectors in, in the product of two open simplices where two coordinates are the same. So th th I can't draw that because uh, now you are in, in six-dimensional space. On the other hand, it's very easy in this case to see that the complement of this space consists of 20 contractible components because, well, what is the complement? The complement arises that you impose an order. You, you disallow that Si is equal to t Tj, so in all cases every Si has to be less than yeah, wh wh what you have to write down is the order of the uh, SIs combined with the order of the TJs. And uh, well, how, many, how many possibilities is it to interleave three within six? Well, it's six, choose two components, and each of them is easily seen to be contractible. An argument that's much easier than the, the one I showed you there. So what I claim is uh, uh, whether you look at the space of directed paths in such a situation or whether you look at such a configuration space, it doesn't matter in the end. So let's get, uh, quickly go through the argument in the case where you have these point obstructions. So what I draw here is a way of coming from an element uh, from a, a number of times to a directed path. And the, the idea is very easy. But first of all, you put all your P's and V's at into the integer points, and then you say, okay, uh, if I have a, 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 a tuple of, of times, you just take a piecewise linear pa point, that a piecewise linear path that says at the first time you reach uh, obstruction number one, at the second time you reach obstruction number two, and so on. And uh, what you can do for one path, so this is the one-dimensional situation, you can do for several of them in common, and what you get is a piecewise linear path that is now living not in R, but is living in Rn. So it just tells you that at certain instances, you reach the integral, integral points. And now the question is, do you reach several integral points at the same time? And that's exactly the situation that the forbidden configurations that we talked about earlier correspond to the forbidden region to the holes in the other picture. So whether you look at it 
in this timed way, living in the product of uh, simplicities, or whether you do it by these directed paths with forbidden regions, it comes out as the same. And in fact, the proof that the map that you get here actually is a homotopic equivalence is quite easy. I have don't have time to go through it, but when you think about it, it's not difficult. So we can use the representation I had before, but we can also use the representation by something that somehow smells like the complement of, a, of, a, of an arrangement. <coughs> so let's look at a, a simple case where um, not this technology, but something else has been used, that, but, but that we can recap in this situation. So let's think about a situation where we have a torus, like uh, Samuel showed you, when you uh, include loops, toruses can arise as state spaces with one pointed hole. If you go over to the universal cover with directions, then the state space would be Rn, where you take out all the points, the I put them here at integer points. And now you can uh, uh, think about what, what corresponds to, sorry, what, co what is it that corresponds to space to directed paths with a given multi-degree. So when I say I go three times around this direction and two times around this direction, the, the multi-degree has to be non-negative in order to be, so that it is possible to realize it by a directed path. So what you get is the space of all paths in such a torus going from the start to, well, you say uh, how many times you go around it in one way or the other one. So this is a vector again. So zero, the fat zero is a zero, 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 and this is K1, K2, and so on. Okay, and then it turns out, well, that you in fact can calculate the homology and also the cohomology of this state space. And uh, I mean, in, in the first place, we guessed how the cohomology would look like. And then you can think about, well, you have to run around such an obstruction a number of times. So probably it is, is a product of, of, of spheres. And uh, which, how many of them that, that you have? Well, it depends on which of the obstructions you choose while running around of them. And then you can find out, well, this is, this is in fact the case. And what you can calculate is the homology in terms of, well, the Poincaré polynomial or Poincaré series of the homology, you can calculate the Betty numbers, and the Betty numbers are all of the form of a binomial uh, coefficient, and, the, and they are all concentrated in particular dimensions. And I have no, no way of uh, going through the, uh, the proof, but again, homotopic limits uh, come into, you can compare spaces of various multi-degrees with each other, and then apply some recursion, and, and, and you have to use a spectral sequence uh, comparing the homology of the homotopy limits with the co-limit of the homologies that arise from the individual spaces. And now let's try to understand it in, uh, in fact, even a generalization. At least I'll, I'll try to, to get you through uh, uh, how the combinatorics enters into the picture. I have no time to get into the combinatorics. In fact, Roy, who is in the audience, would be much better to explain it than I am. So here's the situation. Instead of just having pointed obstructions, you, you, do, uh, you say the following. n in brackets means you have the integers from 1 to n. And now you look at any possible family of subsets of those. So. Uh, one, two, three, and one, two, and, and, and so on. Um, and you can impose that it's, it should be closed upwards. And now I formulate, first of all, what the forbidden, uh, what we forbid. Well, what we forbid is whenever you have an element, uh, a subset in the family, then we forbid that um, all the uh, um, coordinates from this particular family are integrals. So now I don't impose that they are all integrals, but though only those specified by an element in the family have to, be, uh, uh, it's not allowed that th those are all integers. And now the state space is the complement. And what we want to know, uh, some information about the state space of all paths in such a state space. 
that arises in this particular way. And now, I mean, now it becomes tricky. And instead of sh showing you this formulation, uh, nobody can understand it in, 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 in uh, when you look at uh, such a slide. Slide, but just let me show you what happens. In fact, so one can look at certain situations. So here I have a family one, two, a family two, three, and a family one, three. So this is the first um, thread. This is the second one. This is the third one. And the situation that I want to forbid, for example, is that the first instance on the, the first time, the first time, I'm sorry, the first time on the first thread is the same as the first one on the second one. And I want also to forbid that the second one on the second one is equal to the first one on the third, and so on. So, so there are three such situations that you forbid. And in, in, in general, what you, what you get is a forbidden space that consists of unions of such, let's say, uh, individual individual forbidden chunks somehow. And also in that situation, generalizing a little bit what I showed you before, it's not difficult to show that this space that arises as the complement as a lot of ch forbidden chunks somehow, and compare it with the state space, the space of all directed paths, where what you get out of it is a homotopy equivalence. So how can we use that to make actual calculations? Well, we in fact, what one tries to do in the first place is not to calculate uh, information about the complement, but to, to, to uh, infer information about what is forbidden. So, so we consider what is allowed to be the complement of something that is forbidden. And these are, in a sense, these are completed arrangements. So you have to complete everything, so you, you, you add a, a point at infinity, if you wish, or uh, um, a compactification, you, you use a compactification. What we have here is a product of simplices, so if you compactify it, what you get out of it is, is in the end, is a sphere of some appropriate uh, dimension. So if we are able to understand the homotopy uh, type of what we have to exclude, then we can use Alexander duality because everything l lives in a sphere to infer information about the homology of what we in fact are interested in. And now, well, there are, uh, we steal some work that has been versatile when people looked at arrangements in, in the very end. And I have no time to go into the detail, but I, I can tell you what is really interesting. You get a wedge decomposition and the wedge decomposition tells you ab about, okay, what happens at the, sp at the space that's, uh, okay, we have first to, to talk about this intersection poset. So we had all these chunks of disallowed areas. They intersect with each other and form an intersection poset that may be a quite complicated poset situation. Some of them are uh, empty, some of them are not empty. And again, it's 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 imp important to get hold on which of them are which on which of them are not. So in the case they are not empty or empty in this case means that they correspond to a point at infinity. Well, you, you find out that every contribution by itself is given by a bunch of equations, and the bunch of equations when you complete it in the end, it's not so imp not so. Um, it's, it's believable, but what you get out of it is, an, is a sphere of an appropriate dimension. And this is just the number of equations that you have that you have to subtra subtract. And the second entry th that you have is the order complex you get from the intersection poset. And here you look at everything that is below a certain point in the order, order complex. And you have to put this information together by a join, and then you take a wedge and the the wedge lemma by Ziegler and Zivalovich, that's already more than 20 years old, is a way of how you find the homotopic limit in a simple case. In a simple case, it looks like you, you have just such a wedge situation. And now I'm sure there is something that I want to jump over very quickly because this, this is, sorry, dirty combinatorics, and I'm not, not that good at, at it, and uh, it would be completely impossible to go through it in in, 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 in this reduced time that we have. But what I want to focus on is, uh, is that it makes, us, it makes it possible to calculate the Poincaré It makes it possible to, uh, to calculate Poincaré series, so the information about the betting numbers 
ordered in this way, so to t to the i correspond the i minus 1 Betty numbers, the uh, advantage of using it, this shifted for Curie series is that it now becomes a homomorphism on the one set under a wedge, on the other, other hand under join, and that's what, what what's going on when you look at the ziegler zewalewicz lemma. So in any case, I don't want you to, to, to understand that, but I just uh, want to say that when you in the end look at the Poincaré series of the, of the spaces of all die paths, well, there is a contribution that has, to do, uh, that has to do in the end with some countings that come from the order complex and the, uh, that, uh, sorry, that comes from the sphere that you attach and some information that comes from the order complex and when you put that together, in, in case you are, you, are, you are able to underst understand this part, this part is easy to calculate, this part is maybe difficult to can calculate, then you can, by using Alexander duality and see how the Poincaré series of the complement and the Poincaré series of the space you are, that you are after, how they are related, you can get information about that. But instead of going to the combinatorics, let me just give you some uh, some specific cases where it gives you some results that maybe you are, you are interested in. So the first case, uh, uh, very simple, that maybe is the one that, that is somehow interested, interesting for uh, application, is just asking about well, the connectivity of this space. And in this situation you can see quite easily from an analysis that well, if you, if you look at spaces of a certain cardinality, so all of these spaces have, have to have a minimal cardinality, then you can say, okay, if this minimal cardinality is at least three, then you get a space that is connected. So in fact, so for example, that has something to do with mutexes is excluded, and we have already seen as soon as you have mutexes, you would expect many, um, uh, many, many components. And it's generalizable to say something about K-connectivity, so if you have a a higher, if you know more about about the c uh, cardinality of these spaces, you get also a, a, a connectivity results. This is just to say, well, uh, we recap uh, an, a result by koresky mcpherson on these uh, on these um, complements of no k equal spaces and generalizations. But let me also say that this result by Jemanski and myself can be relatively easy taken out of this machinery and finally also the case where you disallow equalities for k for s or more sorry s or more um, instances you can at least you can find out that the homology of such a space is concentrated in dimensions that are multiples of s sorry but these are cases in which is in, in fact it is possible to get some information about the order complex. The general situation is complicated, but because these order complexes can also be as, complica ob as complex as you, as you would like. And just in the light of the information that you can get as complicated uh, spaces of die paths, I mean, there is no miracles in this world. I mean, <laughs> the, the, these, the complexity of the die paths is somehow has to be found again in the complexity of these, of these order complexes. So uh, just to compare the two, the two approaches I've shown to you, I will only have very brief time to show you the third one, is, um, well, the configuration space approach is favorable because the dimensions now, instead of being multiplicative, are additive. This is much, makes it much uh, more versatile. On the other hand, we have not been, uh, we are not far enough to say how this works in the case, this Wetzlemer strategy case works in the case of inequality. So if you have uh, seen uh, all these uh, forbidden areas that we looked about come from equalities and not inequalities, whereas the, uh, the case where we really work with uh, obstructions, well that then inequalities come into the picture and then the situation becomes more difficult and it's not well understood so far. So uh, that's, 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 that's a topic that, that, that we still work on. So let me, let me end up the last minutes to show you a third approach that even is a little bit more general. It all starts with this picture, and when you, when you understand this picture, you are half, halfway through. <coughs> so
So what I sh show you here is the picture of a permatohedron. A permatohedron is a is a um, it's a polytope. As its vertices, it has all the all the per per permutations of a number of elements. So these are the vertices. And when you look at the edges, I mean, you can understand. Uh, now let me give the interpretation. So this uh, vertex, I understand that three comes before four and becomes before two and becomes before one. When I look at this edge here, I would say, well, uh, I have th three coming before the pair of two and four, and then after that one will come. And if you look at all this uh, this uh, hexagon, uh, well, it tells you that three. Uh, let's see, how is it? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's always something you have two d divisions less, so in this case it would be, I have to think about it, three comes before uh, one, two, and four, and so on. So, so it's divided up in this case by hexagons and, and, and squares. It depends on where this, di this division is lying. And um, well, this I mean, saying about uh, how many, how many, pos how many are allowed at the same time has something to do with the capacity. So, if the capacity of one uh, semaphore is three, well, what you then get is the boundary of the boundary of the permutahedron, which is just the two sphere. If you just allow, allow at most two of them to be together, well, then then you disallow this hexagon. You disallow this hexagon. So, what's left is a sphere from which you have digged have taken out eight faces, that's the same as eight points in, t in uh, topologically speaking, so what you get is a, s is a wedge of seven one spheres. And capacity one, well the only thing that left is, is the edges, is, is the vertices, so this gives you f 24 disconnected vertices. So how can one do that in more general, uh, in a more general case? So Due to time, I, 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 I just tell you, well, you have seen the definition of a pre set in, in the talk by Samuel. Uh, one has to fix here proper pre sets that are, uh, have the special property that every individual cube is identified if you just know its extreme vertices. So uh, if you just know the extreme vertices, you have only one cube <coughs> with that. You have a geometric realization of that that you have seen. And now it turns out that instead of looking at all possible paths in such a uh, pre-cubical complex, one can concentrate on ones that are called tame in the work of Ziemanski. So he considers paths uh, with the property that when you, when you go from one cube to a neighboring cube, the only way you can do that is that you pass through a vertex. You are not allowed to, to go through the middle of some, 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 some face. He then also shows by a right quite complicated argument that the inclusion of the space of all tame paths into the space of all paths is in fact a homotopy equivalence in the, in the case where you have a proper proper complex. Um, I think there, there are other ways to show that, but, but that's important because now you can concentrate on something much more combinatorial. You can concentrate again on 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 paths that are con that are contained in a cube chain, so a cube chain that would be something like, well, you have maybe a path like that, <coughs> a, 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 a cube like that, and you compose with a just a two-dimensional cube, and then again a three-dimensional cube on top of that. Sorry, I began to to hard. So this would be a cube chain, and you concentrate on the paths in a cube chain. And when you first of all look at the possible paths, the possible tame paths in such a cube chain, you can start with looking at the cube chains, uh, at the paths, the tame paths within just one of these cubes. And then it turns out, well, what models this is in fact is just a permutahedron of the dimension of that particular cube. And then we, had, then we have several of them in a row. Well, everything can be modeled by a product of such permutahedra. So, what you get out of it is a is a is a space that is modeled from a product of permutahedra that are glued suitably together, and uh, well, it turns out first of all that the space that you get out of it, compared to something completely combinatorial, a chain complex that just tells you, well, how these things combine to each other with faces uh, with, with faces somehow where you, where you take 
phases in the, in the, in the permutohedra. These spaces are homotopic equivalent, and it's possible to, col to calculate even uh, so, so the space of all ch chain, uh, chain, cube chains as such as the combinatorial objects with um, phase maps so that in principle, at least when you have made the transition, you have a boundary map and can calculate all homological information by using this uh, chain complex as a point of departure. And with that, I think I have to close. First of all, again, by showing uh, the book where at least the first part of it is, is explained in, in more detail. I also want to use the opportunity to, use to, to advertise a new journal uh, where it has appeared from this year on, the Journal of Applied and Computational Topology, where you will, after all, you will see uh, research results and we also want to advertise it for yourself to consider it as a, uh, as a means of distributing your own results. So Google it and, and try to find out whether it's uh, interesting for you, also for your publications. And then let me thank you for listening and asking for comments and questions at the very end. Okay, uh, there will be a talk in the conference next week, I believe, that touches, uh, touches on the problem. So, uh, the first thing I can say, uh, I mean, the simplistic idea that you would have is just to take the, uh, the, the definition of an ordinary homotopic equivalence and ask that all the paths, all the, sp all the maps you invoke, and also all the homotopies you invoke, preserve directness. I didn't tell you that, but there is this, I mean, and we, we have so far only talked about directed paths, but there is a, a more general notion of directed maps, maybe Samuel had it, I can't remember, which just says, well, uh, a directed map transports the D paths in space number one into D paths in space number two. So this is how, how, how this has to be preserved. But now, already very simple examples show you that uh, well, knowing that, uh, the uh, uh, say, a map F composed with a map G and, and the other way around, both of them directed and their combinations being homotopic, directly homotopic to the identity in both ways, don't tell you, I would say, anything or uh, nothing, nothing substantial about how the space of paths, directed path in space number one compared to the space of directed paths, in, in, in space number two. So the aim would be to find a good definition of uh, homotopic equivalence, a directed homotopic equivalence that, well, first of all, should be, of course, I mean, this is a necessary condition, the one that I started with, but to, uh, to, to get enough on top of it so that you, in fact, also get, I mean, in, in the best case, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the result that then the spaces of paths saying from sta say from a to b compared to f of a and f of b that those also have to be homot homotopic equivalence in the ordinary sense and when you don't have that i mean it's it's completely useless useless for for our purposes here that's right yeah 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 um yeah, I mean, and what what you have to uh, what you have to, to to do is you have to, well, first of all, <coughs> I mean, it's in, in this case, it's, it's better also to make th the, the space of homotopies to make them directed as well. So you can ask homotopies also to to, to be directed, so th that you have a, s a sense of order between them, and then you have to compare with the space, as you say, you have to p to compare. The start, points, uh, the start points first by going back and forth and the end points going back and forth. You have to compare them with certain paths and these paths should be so that 
Well, the homotopy types don't change under way, under the way, and to to make this uh, to make this work completely, that's 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 not so easy. So there are attempts, and um, I think we'll see one in next week. And I think you should discuss it maybe with me and Jeremy in, in a break. That's a very interesting question. Thank you. <laughs>